so, it's so gratifying to see all of you here to join us to welcome Carl and Stathis, who just joined us as a senior colleague in the Department of Philosophy in the Rotman Institute. And it's been a terrific pleasure for me to uh, organize this event and welcome them. So it was clear in the process of organizing it that not only are they very respected by their colleagues, and I was able to invite the A-list of people who work in their area, and I'm glad that all of you are here to join us. Not only are they well respected, they're also well liked and admired. <laughs> it's just a very gratifying thing given that they're now our colleagues. <laughs> So uh, it's been a real pleasure to organize this conference, and uh, I want to start by just saying thank you to various people who've helped in organizing this. So uh, Rob Reed and Carol Suter, my administrative staff, have been in correspondence with us. They've been terrific help in setting things up. They're not here today, but uh, I want to thank them publicly for their role in, uh, in setting things up and really doing the organizational tasks that philosophers are by nature not good at. Um, and uh, also, of course, uh, uh, there's a very important thank you to Joe Rotten, who's joining us here this morning, for first of all having the vision to set up the Rotman Institute of Philosophy. And I've been working with uh, Joe over the past year when I was uh, serving as interim director. And it's really inspiring to, to have someone who has a vision for a role that philosophy could play in the wider culture that's more ambitious and more inspiring than the role that we sometimes ourselves uh, recognize. And so it's terrific to have somebody encouraging us to do something that is important for philosophy as a profession that we often forget or don't, uh, don't take, up, take upon ourselves. So I really want to thank Joe for both the inspiration and the vision for the Robin Institute and also for his help with this conference in particular and for uh, supporting the idea of having an event of this sort. So um, without further ado, I'd like to then get to the conference and the uh, excitement of hearing all of you speak on issues in philosophy of science. And I'll turn things over to Jillian Barker, who is going to chair this morning's session. So um, one thing that we have thought is that we're this is a wonderful conference and that all of the speakers are among those we can say they need no introduction, so we won't spend too much time on introductions. <laughs> right over to Elliot Sober from uh, Madison. Um, Thank you. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting us to the great occasion for Western and also for Carl and staff. This is really cool. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is some material from a chapter of a book that I'm working on, uh, a general picture of how to understand Occam's razors uh, with plural. I think there are different principles that have different justifications that more or less are lumped together. And then three case studies of how one or another version of the razor has uh, been used in different parts of science. I'll be talking about material from chapter four, and then the last chapter is about the way we philosophers sometimes try to make parsimony arguments. Um, there are really two kinds of parsimony you could think of in connection with the issue of chimpanzee mind reading. By mind reading, uh, what psychologists and philosophers have in mind is not some sort of weirdo occult ability. It just means the ability to form mental representations about the mental states of others. So if I have a belief about what you want or see or believe or intend, that's, that's an example of mind reading. And there, are, and there are two ways in which this is uh, approached in the psychology literature, more often in the form of what I'm calling black box inference, where you look at sti the way chimpanzees behave, how they respond to different stimulus conditions, different facts about their environment, and then you try to judge uh, what's the most plausible picture of the intervening mechanism that allows them to produce that behavior in that circumstance. Uh, and as you'll see, parsimony has been used as a guiding idea and criticized also insight in the psychology literature with respect to mind reading as a problem in black box inference. There's another thing that I won't talk about today where you don't think about black box inference, you, you think about a phylogenetic inference problem where you think that human beings 
have a certain mental state which allows them to perform a behavior. You notice that chimpanzees also perform that behavior. You realize that we have a recent common ancestor, that's only about six million years ago. And then you ask whether the relatedness, the genealogical relatedness of the two species makes it reasonable to think that the same proximate mechanism that we use to produce behavior is also present here. And there's a parsimony argument about that, which I'm not going to talk about. So black box inference and black box parsimony are, are the topics for today. Let me talk about some of the experiments that are out there in the psychology literature. This is, a, and, and you'll see how the issue of parsimony grows out of the question of how you interpret the results of these experiments. So in this experiment, you have two chimps, a dominant and a subordinate chip, who are in cages where there are windows that allow them to see out into a room. And those two dots are food items. Uh, and this is an opaque barrier. So the subordinate can see both food items. The dominant can see only one of them. And the door to the subordinate's cage is opened, and a second later, the door to the dominant's cage is open. And what the subordinate does there is go to the, the food particle, that's the, the food item that's hidden from you, from the dominant. And prima facie, you might think the explanation is the subordinate forms a belief of what, about what the dominant sees and does not see. Um, in, in a variation of this experiment, they replaced that opaque barrier with a transparent barrier, and they didn't get that effect. By the way, there's a background fact here, which is that dominants do not share food with subordinates if you're a chimp. <laughs> and uh, they beat you up if you uh, try to get in the way. And then another aspect of this experiment is they reverse the role of the dominant and subordinate. So the dominant sees both, the subordinate sees only one, the gate, the gate opens to the dominant, and what the dominant does is goes to the food item out in the open and then gets the one that's hidden. So that's an interesting finding too. Here's a variation, another experiment by some of the same people. Uh, there are two opaque barriers, the dominant and subordinates before. In the first setup, a human being places the food item behind one but not the other of the barriers, and the dominant and subordinate both watch. You open the gates, the subordinate won't go for the food item if the dominant has been watching. But if there's no dominant, if, but if the dominant hasn't seen the food being placed, the subordinate goes for it. And then another variation of this experiment, the subordinate and the dominant, the dominant both watch the food item being placed where it is. But then at the last minute, that dominant is taken out of the experiment and a new dominant chimp is put in there who hasn't seen and the subordinate gets it. I mean, yeah, there's always been a dominant there, but that guy doesn't know. So again, it seems like there's some mind reading going on there. Here's another experiment. Again, some of the same people. Uh, the human, for a change, the human being is in a box, not the chimp. And the chimp can see into the box where the human being is through a little window. And uh, the human being can see the chimp if the chimp is out in front, but can't see the chimp if the chimp comes to the side of this box, the walls of the box are opaque. And the chimp, looking in there, will see whether he or she realizes it or not, that there is a transparent tunnel here and an opaque tunnel on the other side. There are two food items there. There's a human being sitting there, and if the chimp comes over here and tries to reach through the tunnel to grab this food item, the human being snatches the food item away, can't get it. On the other hand, if the, hu if the, uh, human be if the chimp comes around to this side and uses the opaque tunnel and tries to reach through and grab that thing, the human, they get it. And after a few trials on this, uh, the, uh, most of the subjects learn that the way to do things here is to use the opaque tunnel. Now, if, so they learn, they get that mostly. Suppose so you took the human subject out there, out, away from the experiment, and there's just these two five food items. Then the chimp doesn't care which tunnel. They just use the, the, the two tunnels with equal frequency. So it looks like they're sensitive to the fact that there being a human being there who will take the food if you use this transparent tunnel, but not if you take the opaque tunnel, is something that's registering. In a follow-up, they switched out vision as the sensory modality with hearing. So now there are two trap doors that the chimp could use to reach in. The, hu the human 
uh, uh, competitor behaves as I just described, and one of those trackers is noisy and the other is silent, if the chimp tries to use the, uses the noisy tunnel, no food, but if they use a silent one, they get it, and they quickly learn to go to use the silent trapdoor, and they preferentially use the silent trapdoor when the human person, the human, the human being is there, take the human being away, and they don't care. So on the face of it, it looks like these experiments suggest that human that chimpanzees form beliefs about what other chimpanzees see or hear or are aware of or know, something like that. Um, Polinelli is a, crit is a well-known critic of people who argue that chimpanzees are mind readers, and he criticized one of the, some of the earlier, earlier studies that I just, some of which I, I described. He says, the general difficulty with these experiments is that the design of these tests necessarily presupposes, this is Povinelli and Bonk, uh, that the subjects notice, attend to, and or represent precisely those observable aspects of the other agent that are being experimentally manipulated. Once this is properly understood, however, it must be conceded that the subject's predictions about the other agent's future behavior could be made either on the basis of a single step from knowledge about the contingent relationships between the relevant and varying features of the agent and the agent's subsequent behavior, or on the basis of multiple steps from the invariant features to the mental state to the predicted behavior. Okay, what is being said here? Well, suppose you uh, are inclined to adopt a mind-reading hypothesis as an explanation of the behavior of the chimpanzees in some of these experiments. So you think that what's going on here is the dominance behavior and facts about the physical environment cause the subordinate to form beliefs about the dominance mind, and that that then causes uh, the, the, the subordinate to behave in some fashion. That's the sort of str this causal chain that's involved in this experiment. You think, being, pre you know, you like the mind reading idea. Pominelli and Vonk are saying, well, the way you get from this to this has got to be by way of the subordinates forming a belief about the behavior of the dominant. So they're saying that's got to be in there. That's how we do it, that's how any organism is going to do it, well, how chimps do it. If they're going to get this, if I have a belief about what you think, it's got to be based on a belief I first have about what you're doing. And then, uh, Pavanelli and Bonk's idea is that if that's what's going, if, if that's really the fuller statement of your hypothesis, you can simply snip out a commitment <coughs> to the mind reading aspect and just leave the behavior reading as the sort of earlier link in the uh, in the, pro in the uh, causal chain, and what you've got now is a behavior, purely behavior reading hypothesis, and the conclusion they draw is that these two models are statistically indistinguishable. You, the, the data doesn't tell you which is better if your data are simply your observation of what the subordinate does given different facts about the dominance behavior. You may like the first one better than the second, but the data aren't telling you that you should. That's their claim, I think. Now, Thomas Sella one of, and Call, one of the players in the experiments that I was describing, who were endorsing the idea that chimpanzees are mind readers, replied uh, to Pavanelli and Bonk's criticism as follows. They say, the results of each experiment may be explained by postulating some behavioral rule that individuals have learned that does not involve an understanding of seeing. But the postulated rule must be different in each case, and most of these do not explain more than one experiment. The patchiness of coverage gives this kind of explanation a very ad hoc feeling, especially since there's rarely any concrete evidence that animals have had the requisite experiences or learned the behavioral rule. There is just a theoretical possibility. It is thus more plausible to hypothesize that apes really do know what others do what others do and do not see in many circumstances. So it looks like they're saying, yeah, you can make up a behavior reading explanation that will fit the data, but there's some other consideration that should lead you to think that there's a flaw in that explanation, that you're better off with the less ad hoc, more unifying uh, explanation in terms of mind reading. If you don't do the mind reading thing, you're going to have to have separate explanations for each of the behaviors, you got mind reading, you got this kind of unified explanation. 
I'm reading it a little bit, but I don't think too much. Uh, Papinelli and Bach reply to this, and they think, not unreasonably, I think, that what Thomasella et al. are saying is that parsimony is on the side of mind reading. And Papinelli and Bach do not like that at all. Here's their criticism of that, that thought, that unification, parsimony is, uh, uh, that, that parsimony as what the other side means by unification is on the side of mind reading. No, they say. They say reasoning about mental states must entail observing and reasoning about behavior, Pavanelli and Bonk say. That's the snipping argument I mentioned before. And on the basis of such observed features, generating and reasoning about representations of unobserved mental states. Thus, the capacity to reason about mental states does not somehow relieve the burden of representing the massive nuances of behavior or the statistical invariances that sort them into more and less related groups. In either event, these behaviors Behavioral abstractions must be represented. Thus, there is no sense in which a system that makes inferences about behavioral concepts alone provides a less parsimonious account of behavior than a system that must make all of those same inferences plus generate inferences about mental states. So they're saying because, they say, uh, if you're a mind reader, you must also be a behavior reading. They're saying that the mind reading hypothesis has to be more complex because it's got both behavior reading and mind reading in it. And if, if you want to go with parsimony as a guide here, you've got to say that that counts in favor of the pure behavior reading. Two is a lot smaller number than one, parsimony. So the question then comes up is, does introducing an intervening variable which is what you're doing if you drop mind reading into the mix in addition to the behavior reading that's not in dispute. Does that ever increase the parsimony of, of a model? Uh, and separately, is it really true that there's no experimental evidence that could tell you whether to introduce an intervening variable that involves mind reading? So those are the two questions I want to talk about now. There's a background to this. Uh, Andrew White in 1996, another participant in this mind reading, behavior reading dis dispute, uh, produced this fascinating uh, picture. He says, look, in the history of experimental psychology, yeah, maybe we started out being behaviorists, but we realize that there's often compelling reason to introduce an intervening variable. And he talks about this as an example of how that goes. You notice that rats, if they're deprived of water, if they fed dry food, if they have saline objections, produce an enhanced rate of bar pressing to get more water, they drink more water, and their quinine tolerance changes in some way. And each of the things on the left causes each of the things on the right. But if you introduce an intervening variable called first, you can explain how these guys all call these guys. And look at the number of arrows. <laughs> Six is a smaller number than nine. And so the argument for intervening variables here is that you can make a more economical theory by introducing intervening variables. So here's a case in which parsimony is on the side of adding something. Sounds weird. It looks like parsimony should always be on the side of subtracting. Well, if you're counting arrows, adding, oh, adding a, an intervening variable allows you to reduce the number of arrows. And Whiten wants us to count arrows. So maybe, and I think Thomas Sowell and Cole, when they talk about unification and not ad hoc and stuff, are kind of, they don't cite Whiten's paper, but it's part of this literature. They know his work. Uh, I think this is in the background, this idea. I don't think it, I'm not. I'm not saying it, it was, that Whiten was the first person to have this idea, but there is a, a, a justification. Um, Whiten doesn't say much about what he means by more economic. It seems like he's just counting arrows. Sometimes it seems like he's talking about how it's more adaptive for organisms, better for <laughs> organisms, to have intervening variables, which maybe it's true, but to me that's not really the question of black box inference, not what is, whether it would be good for organisms if they had it, but do they actually have it? Uh, and sometimes he seems to be just 
talking about the scientist's mental effort and perhaps the ink that's spilled in, in, in uh, drawing your hypothesis. So in any event, he doesn't get into the epistemological questions of why we should be counting arrows here. Why not count the number of intervening variables? And then we get a different answer you get because zero is smaller than one. So what's so great about arrows? Here's a way of seeing uh, a reason to be suspicious about arrow counting as the real deal. Here's the structure of Whiten's diagram where I get all the details about mice out there. Three causes and three effects, nine arrows here and six arrows here. But instead of having three causes here, imagine that each is dichotomous. Why not just talk about a single cause that has six possible states? From a kind of mathematical point of view, that's no different. That thing over on the upper right is no different from that. And, and we do the same thing here, and we get the two diagrams there where we're talking about one, so to speak, composite cause rather than three separable causes. What's the difference? And now the arrow counting is in favor of the, not the intervening variable model, but the one that omits it. So it seems like arrow counting has this problem that it, it, it focuses on features of how you happen to represent the models you're talking about. And of course, we want to judge models, scientists like to want to judge models by what they say. And how you happen to say them is an incidental feature. It shouldn't matter to your evaluation of a model, whether it's stated in English or Chinese. It shouldn't matter to a model whether you diagram it this way or that way. It's the same model. So don't go with arrow counting. That's part of the suggestion. However, there's something else about the Whiten models. And this doesn't depend on whether you think there are three causes in the, in the mouse example, the rat example, or one. Um, the no intervening variable model has the cause, or three causes, it doesn't matter, each arrow in each of those guys over there. The intervening variable looks like this. And if we borrow an idea from uh, causal modeling literature in Bayes' nets, and impose this idea that's used there called the causal Markov condition, it turns out that there is an observational difference between these models. Because understood in that way, the, this model says that C screens off, the cause screens off each of the effects from each other. And this says that the cause does not screen off. Um, what does screening off mean? It means that if you hold fix the state of the cause, uh, E1 and E2 are probabilistically independent of each other. E2 and E3 are probabilistically independent of each other, and so on. So uh, that's a difference that you could actually get data to evaluate. So let's look at that. And notice how this is a, an idea that a lot of people in this literature think there's no way that the data is going to help you. You need something extra empirical like parsimony or something. And the thing that's cool about this, thing, this fact about causal modeling is that if you just have a causal chain from one cause to one effect, snipping out an intervening variable doesn't give you a model that makes a predictive difference where your data set is facts about how cause and effect are associated. Chains are statistically uh, indistinguishable from each other if some have intervening variables that the others omit. But when you don't have a chain, but you have this kind of structure, it actually makes a difference if you take out an intervening variable, an observational difference. Let's look at, so let me, some of you know what screening off is, a lot of you do, perhaps some do not. Let me just give a real simple example that'll sort of illustrate what this is about. And here I'm going to talk about something that's a black box, but not in the metaphorical sense. It's really a black box. There's a button on the left side. There are two lights on the right side. You get to push the button. And what you observe after you push the button a lot of times is the frequency of the first lights going on when the button is pushed is 80% of the time. And that's also the frequency of the second lights going on when the button is pushed. And you suppose you observe also that when you push the button, 80% of the time, both of the lights go on. Notice that that's an extra fact. I didn't say how, up here how often they both go on. I just said how often the one goes on, how often the other goes on. Um, 
suppose 75%. And what's so interesting about that? Well, notice that 75% is greater than the product of 80 and 80. 75 is bigger than 64. Well, these frequencies, if that's what you observed and you've done a lot of button pushing, are evidence against the screening off hypothesis because the screening off hypothesis says that the probability of them both being on should equal the probability of the first being on times the probability of the seconds being on. If the, if the screening off hypothesis were true, you should expect, if you're getting 80 and 80, you get something around 64%. But you didn't, you got something bigger. And let's suppose you did enough trials in your experiment that 75% is not just bigger than 64, but it's significantly bigger according to the statistical test that you're thinking about. So the intuitive idea is when you get data, like notice this is just observational data. You haven't opened up the black box. You're just getting statistics on the observed, the observation, you're pushing the button sometimes, and the observation that one or both of the lights are going on at different times. So this makes a prediction about what your data should look like. Uh, and the screening off hypothesis says you shouldn't see what you're seeing here. I'm putting it loosely. And what this, what this test is telling you, if you compare the V model with the Y model, I use these, this terminology because V is the shape of this connection between input and output between stimulus and response. And why is the shape of that one? What your data is telling you here is that you're getting the data saying, here's some evidence that favors the intervening variable picture over the no intervening variable picture. OK. Now, let's think about how you, OK, so I hope that sort of makes sense intuitively. You got this black box, you do the experiment, and if the results are as I described, you can, I, I hope you see why it kind of makes sense to think that the Y model is better supported than the, 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 uh, the V model. Observational evidence for the introduction of an intervening variable. Now there's a simple fact about the experiment that we're talking about here uh, that I want to draw your attention to. Namely, the way we do it is we have a bunch of different times, and each time we push the button, and we record each for time one whether this one goes on or this and, and or this one goes on. So we write yes or no in each of these boxes. Then we move to the second time uh, and do the same thing. So we've got this in the experimental design. We, the experiment involves a pairing of outcomes for the first light and outcomes for the second light at the same time. And we move through time and get bunch, a bunch of data on this. It wouldn't be a good experiment if we're trying to test for screening off. If, first of all, I run an experiment in which I simply record whether or not light one is going on, and then I wait a year, and then I do a second experiment and record how often light two is going on, that will give me the frequency of yes for L1 and the frequency of yes for L2. But it's not giving me that question about the conjunction. How often are they on together? And the reason is that if I do the experiment first for L1 and then for L2, there's no, there's no real natural pairing of outcomes for L1 that get to be written in the same column as entries for L2. So the experiment I described has this simple feature which allows you to test for screening off. Without it, it seems hopeless. Well, what I want to do is take two of the experiments from that I described before, which were done a year apart. It was the same chimps both times, but a year apart. And I want to combine them into a single experiment that looks like that. OK, so remember in this one, the humans inside, there's a transparent and an opaque trap door. In the second experiment that they did, they didn't, it wasn't whether the chimp sees something, but whether the chimps hear, sorry, it isn't whether the chimp forms a belief about what the human sees. And the second experiment is whether the chimp forms a belief about what the human being hears. These were done a year apart. Um, and we want to see what we want to take these two things and put them together into an experiment, a single experiment that runs like that. So here's this experiment. It's just taking these two separate things that Mel has said all did and saying, let's make them into the same kind of experiment we did on the black box, 
At each moment, the chimps, each chimp faces a pair of problems. First, they've got to go into this experimental setup, the first wing of the experiment, and choose between the opaque and the transparent tunnels. Then right after that, they walk into another room, and they've got to choose between these. Then we wait a bit, and we go to the second time, and we give them this, again the same pair. And notice the data will accumulate, we'll have behaviors here and here, behaviors here and here. And so we'll get statistics of the following kind. How frequently does this chimp <coughs> choose opaque over transparent? How frequently does it choose silent over noisy? And how often does it choose both of them together? So now we're getting the kind of data we need to actually test for screening off. Now, OK, so I hope the, the, the sort of analogy <coughs> with the black box case shows you why this experiment will allow you to test whether a screening whether a screening off whether screening off or no screening off is, is the right picture to have of what the chimps are doing here. Remember the screening off idea is the idea that declines to postulate an intervening variable here. And the no screening off idea, the idea that B does not screen, the button doesn't screen off one light or the other, is what you have the entailment from the intervening variable model. So the, the picture from the, from the black box is this. Put an intervening variable in there, that predicts you should have no screening off. Don't put one there, let your model just be the kind of thing on the left. That predicts you should get screening off. You get data if you have the experiment set up in the right way, this natural pairing of the tunnel test and the trapdoor test. And you can test for screening off. Now the next step that I'm going to take is what is screen is going to ask the question, what is the screening off idea, yes or no, have to do with mind reading versus behavior reading? Because that's this is that's what we want here. We want this to be a test. What, what I want here is a test of the mind reading model against the pure behavior reading model, where it turns out to be relevant whether or not it's screening off. So let me describe the models that I made up that give me what I want here. Uh, this is not the only way to do it. Okay, so let's talk about the behavior reading model here. So sometimes these chips are gonna get the tunnel test, sometimes they're gonna get the trapdoor test. And the, the behavior reading hypothesis says that what's gonna happen when the uh, chip ends using the tunnel test is the question, you can ask when the chip is gonna form this belief about that's not, that's behavior pure, involves pure behavior reading. The chimp might think, I'll get food if I use the opaque tunnel, but not if I use the transparent tunnel. And when they face the trapdoor test, perhaps they'll form this belief that, yeah, I'll get food if I use the uh, quiet trapdoor, but not if I use the noisy trapdoor. And if they do form this belief, the model says, they'll use the opaque tunnel. And if they do form this belief, they'll use the quiet trapdoor. Okay, that's just a way of, introducing intervening variables here. Notice that both these guys have intervening variables. The boxes are intervening variables between stimulus conditions and responses. They both do that, but the character of what these intervening variables are said to be like is different. The, this involves no mind reading. A quick a point about these arrows. Understand these as probability raising. Okay, this raises the probability that they'll think that. It, it's not a, a, a necessitation relation. I'm not saying, the model doesn't say, and if it did say this would just be wrong because look at the data, that whenever they put the tunnel, they must and they will get that. Yeah. So you gotta understand that this model just says that inputs raise the probability of outputs. And, okay, there's something else I should say about the behavior reading hypothesis which you can guess because notice that red vertical arrow in the mind reading hypothesis. It's not in the behavior reading. I'll come back to that difference. But now let's look at what the, the mind reading hypothesis says. Well, again, you've got an intervening variable, two intervening variables that are introduced, one for the tunnel test, one for the uh, trapdoor test. Except now the intervening variables concern whether this, the, the, the subordinate chimp thinks something about what the dominant sees in the tunnel test, whether the subordinate forms a belief about what the dominant hears in the trapdoor test. And otherwise, it's just the idea that these guys raise the probability of these. That's what the mind reader says. Those are the intervening variables. They involve mind reading. 
So, so far it looks like they're just disagreeing about how you fill in the boxes, but what's the big deal difference? The difference, as I see it, and I want to, I'll try to defend this, is I think I'm entitled to put a vertical arrow in the first one, the mind reading thing, and I don't have one here. What does that mean? And is it plausible? Okay, what I'm thinking is that if this chimpanzee is a mind reader, then if it forms the belief about seeing in the tunnel test, then when it steps into this um, track door test, that belief, having that belief before raises the probability that it's going to form the belief about what the, what the dominant can hear. If you're a mind reader, you have the capacity to see a connection between the first experiment and the second in the sense that believing that makes it more likely that you'll believe that. Again, the arrow does not mean necessitation, it just means probability raising. And that's what that arrow represents, that mind readers have this capacity. It doesn't mean they always get it or even if they usually get it. It's just that their probability of getting there is greater if they form that, first, that top belief than if they don't. <clears throat> Whereas, I want, to I want to understand the behavior reader, you know, reader is saying, that he, this, forming this belief does not raise the probability of forming that belief. If you're a behavior reader, you're not going to see a connection between uh, choosing a tunnel here, you know, and this new thing where you're, you're thinking, should I choose a tunnel, should I choose a, a quiet or a noisy trap door there? If you set up the models as I have done, where you got a vertical arrow on the top one but not on the bottom one, then you get a difference in what these models entail about screening off. This says the stimuli screen off the first behavior from the second behavior on the right. The, <coughs> the mind reader reading hypothesis says these two, did I say screen off? These two do not screen off. That's what I meant to say. This model says these two screen off. So we got a predictive difference between them. <coughs> and so we can run the experiment and, and see whether the outcomes will favor the mind reading or the behavior reading. I'm not taking any stance on what the outcome will be or whether the chimps are really mind readers. I'm trying to design an experiment that would actually help here. That's, that's the goal I have. Okay. Uh, I think I can. Ten. Okay, I think I can do the rest. I, this, this new section. So, okay, so I talked about this, you know, recent problem in, in comparative psychology, and I want to connect what I'm saying to this older, older, and perhaps more familiar problem in philosophy of mind: behaviorism versus mentalism. And I want to examine a consequence of the Povinelli and Vonk logical problem, the snipping argument that I mentioned, and think about what that means. So you remember that when Povinelli and Vonk look at the mind reading hypothesis, they say, look, if you're going to say that these chimps are doing the mind reading, they first, there's the, the, the dominant chimps behavior, the subordinate forms a belief about that behavior, the subordinate is then going to form a belief about the dominant's mind, and then finally the subordinate <coughs> belief. If you're, going to do, if you're going to say that this causes a mind reading belief, then it has to be, there has to be this or something. And then they snip away the mind reading and say, well, look, look at this pure behavior reading hypothesis. These are statistically indistinguishable. So don't tell me that your data supports mind reading. That's Povinelli and Vaughn. We can take this argument one step forward and do another snipping, and we get a no reading hypothesis. <laughs> and of course, this is statistically indistinguishable from these two. They, if your data is just the association of the dominance behavior and the subordinate behavior, your, your evidence isn't, isn't helping you here. Now, you might think that this is a reductio of Povinelli and Vaughn. You might say, if you were writing your criticism, you'd have to be a behaviorist. They don't want to be a behaviorist. Uh, so how does this, this snipping argument apply to the question of behaviorism versus mentalism? I don't think it is a, I don't think it, just 
look ahead a second. I don't think it is a reductio. I think it's a correct consequence, which means that if you're going to get evidence that tells you that behaviorism is, is, is mistaken, you better not be looking at causal chains. You should be looking at forks or something with a different kind of structure. That's why I want to use screening off test there. So that's, I, I don't think, I mean, you might, I think it's very natural to think, look, if your argument tells you that there can't be any experimental evidence about whether behaviorism is true, that's crazy. Well, it's not quite, I think it's not, although perhaps they're thinking of it that way, is that's not the strong conclusion that I think is really involved here. What I think they are charitably interpreted, what I think they're saying is, if you're just looking at a single causal chain with different stuff in, inside it, then you've got a problem. But why would we have to just look at chains? Okay, now Dan Bennett has this paper uh, called Skinner's Skin in which he makes two claims about um, behaviorism. First, that it won't work for the explanation of novel behaviors. And also, separately, he says mental explanations have a generality that behaviorist explanations don't have. And the example, if you remember the paper, is from Skinner. It's the example of somebody being robbed for the first time. And then it says, look, I've never been robbed before. The robber walks up to me and puts a gun out like this, says, your money or your life, so I gingerly hand over my wallet. Uh, don't tell me, Mr. Behaviorist, that that's because I was conditioned by previous encounters with <laughs> robbers who do that. I never was robbed before. And when I've been threatened before, says Dan, my behavior seems to have worked okay, is to apologize, not to hand money over to people who threaten me. So from the point of view of, the only way to explain, to describe why this is not a novel thing for me is to use mentalistic language. What's not novel about the robbery is when Dan has been threatened in, plausible, in ways that he finds plausible in the past, he has been inclined to believe that the best strategy for, to use is to do what, is, what, 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 what the requirement is behind the threat. Well, that's saturated with mentalistic language. If you describe it that way, behaviorists can't touch it. The, the only way to really explain what's going on, because it's novel in the sense that Dan has in mind, is to, is to use a mentalistic, not a behaviorist explanation. Well, I, I think this is an example. I'm not going to go along with the idea that behaviorists can't explain this. But let's look carefully at which part of behaviorism this argument actually attaches to. It could attach to the um, negative thesis that you shouldn't explain behavior by postulating intervening variables. Or it could be attached to this positive thesis that the, the behaviorist advances, that you ought to explain behaviors non-mentalistically by talking about the history of conditioning. And I think what's going on in this story is a criticism of that, I accept, but it doesn't really address this. Now, the other part of Dan's story, which is kind of separate from the article, involves this idea of generality. He points out that there are lots of ways you can get me to hand over my wallet. One is the man with the gun, the first example. But if a woman shows up with a bomb, I'll do it, and we can add, if you, were, if, you, if you handed Dan a threatening letter of a certain kind, you'd get the wallet handing over too. And Dan says, look, if you're a behaviorist, you just have to treat these as different kinds of uh, explanations. I hope that sounds like what Tomasello et al. said, that it has a kind of ad hoc feel. You're not unifying these. Whereas if you introduce uh, Dan's uh, mental state, as a mentalist would want to do, you tie these together and explain why each of them produces the same result, the same behavior. So general, the, gen, the, the mentalistic explanation is more general and therefore better. That's, I think, what's behind Dan's generality idea here. But again, think of the Povinelli and Vaughn point. These two models are statistically indistinguishable from each other if all you're observing is the association of stimulus conditions and responses. The generality doesn't cut the ice. What we need here is not one effect, but multiple effects. And then let's see if there's some screening off going on. But that's not what you get if you're only looking at a single effect. OK, so here are my conclusions. The statistical test I described 
about concerning screening all, I think stands on its own two feet regardless of whether you think that parsimony is relevant to this question and regardless of whether you think arrow counting is the right way to get at what's parsimonious. I think Povinelli and Vaughn are right that these two theories are statistically indistinguishable when you're talking about a causal chain, the snipping argument I, I'm representing is applying there, but it's actually wrong when you think about multiple effects and you're thinking about introducing an intervening variable as in the case of the black box where the Y versus the V model make different predictions that you can check using observations. Uh, some complications I won't, um, I didn't talk about. I constructed a mind reading and a behavior reading hypothesis that differed over what they say about screening off. I wanted to do that, so I did it. Uh, you might think, well, okay, maybe there are behavior reading hypotheses that would predict, predict no screening off. I mean, why do you get to associate mind reading versus behavior reading with no screening off versus screening off. And that's, that's part of my argument. And I, I haven't said, I mean, I said why I think it's plausible. I don't say it's the only way of setting up these things. And finally, something I didn't mention before is if you're gonna run this two-winged experiment that I'm describing where the chip is alternating between one kind of test and another and you to get data on whether screening off is true, you're not going to get, and you're hoping, maybe you like mind reading, so you're hoping to get evidence that screening off is violated. Some advice. Don't make the test too hard, because then the chimp is just going to be, the test too hard. Because if it's really hard, the chimp's just going to end up guessing, and you're going to get no screening off. Even if, even if they have a more modest ability, you, you've made the test way too hard. And if you make it too easy, they're just going to get the right answer on both, and that's not going to be screening off either. So there's this middle range of problems that I think is the place that you have to, you have to find where that is, where there's variation. Um, it's, it's hard, but not too hard. Easy enough to sometimes get it right, but not too easy. And then that's the place to see, do I get a failure screening off? So I, this, the talk was about black box inference, which is that, that was the problem. And my solution was to channel Hans Reichenbach and think about common causes. Thanks. <laughs>
in it, you know, something that would test mind reading. Yes. And then she Pavanelli's that experiment. So you know, which suggests that there's this really more general philosophy of science bias in the background here that that they that they have. I think that they you can always do this. I mean, it suggests that and, you know, of course, we philosophers of science know you know Craig's theorem and things like that, where we can always strip out the unobservable. That's not quite what's going on here because, and they're not behaviorists because they're attributing some beliefs in right. that. But they're somehow on that state, and it's general. And so I wonder whether that. And so my question is whether, uh, whether maybe um, I don't know. I, I get the sense you're maybe too kind to them in a way because I think you know looking at their work, they also don't believe chimps uh, believe in weight. You know, so how heavy things are, forces, uh, even causation. And so then you start looking at causes, weight, forces, minds, yes. and it starts to look like a kind of general, I mean, I'm not an expert in this, but it starts to look like a general philosophical bias. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, have to get, I, have to, I, I have to get the thesis. I have a, in the, the chapter that I've written, I describe what Povinelli and a collaborator, I don't remember what, whether it was Bob or somebody else, say, these experiments are poorly designed, but here's an experiment that would actually give you evidence if it came out in a certain way that that chimps are mind readers. And uh, actually there's a guy named Fitzgerald who was, uh, no, Fitzpatrick, excuse me, who wrote a paper in 2009 saying, look, Povinelli, your argument would show that that experiment is subject to the sniffing argument just like the other one. So, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I, I think that's a right, the right point. Am I too kind to them? Well, I think Judged on its merits, if you've got a single causal chain and all you're observing is this end of it and that other end of it, all of these different models with different intervening variables there are going to fit the data equally well. I don't, I don't see that the data is helping you there. Um, so I, I, I think that's correct. What I think is not correct, uh, and they don't, they're a little cautious, so maybe I shouldn't say they say, for any model, uh, the snipping argument shows that if the stimulus stimuli and the responses are the same in the different models, you can't get a, an observational difference. They don't actually say anything quite that strong. It's part of the flavor of it. I think that's incorrect. So I am critical of the sort of generalization from chains to forks. Yeah, so that's what I was thinking was, yeah, if they just keep doing the same snipping for the same reason for weight, force, causes, everything else, then yeah, it's, it's yeah, a more general uh, mistake. Well, you, but the snipping, if, you're, if you have a, a fork, I mean, a, an experiment that's designed with a fork, snipping will change the prediction. So it's not like, oh, it's just as good without the intervening variable. No, it changes the prediction. It might be better, it might be worse, but the data can help you there. So I take it that the idea that you could come up with a intervening variable hypothesis that um, does support the alternative behavior of reading. Okay, so um, I could say, uh, that the chimpanzees, say in the subdominant competition cases, that they end up uh, having some kind of representation which is like don't approach food if the dominant is oriented towards it or something like that. Uh, we can make that more complicated. Um, so it seems like then um, that's one way in which we could still maintain that they don't have theory of mind but get out of the problem. And, it, and actually in the literature about New Caledonian crows and complex cognition and insight, that's what people do. So um, there's this competing debate about whether they um, learn to solve complex causal problems like association or whether they do it by having insight. And there's a debate about whether crows have understand abstraction in the way that we do or in some kind of association way. So I was wondering how generalizable the moves we're making here are in terms of actually helping in the literature about comparative psychology. Okay, um, let's see. Um, so the, or, the body orientation thing um, seems to work as, as an alternative hypothesis that fits the data in this, the first experiment that I described. That is, here, make the dominant is looking at that centrally located food item. There, his body or her body, it's a he, is not oriented that way, and so there's a behavior reading explanation of why the subordinate goes for that one not, which is don't go for things 
that the, the dominance body is focused on. So that works for that. Um, in this case, uh, I, there's a little detail I didn't mention. When the human the competitor is in the box, they are looking straight ahead. They're not looking over to the, the, the food in front of the opaque or, or the food in front of the transparent tunnel. And so it can't be just body orientation of the competitor. And the other thing that's, but, but <coughs> here, here's a more general comment. Um, I think it's important to pair, to get these experiments together on the same page. And that's why I, I try to design this two prong, this two wing experiment, where it's really two experiments rolled into a single experiment with two different settings. Um, if you just looked at this by itself, you could probably come up with a behavior reading thing that would predict what you got. And ditto for that one, I guess. But um, that's not getting at the issue of whether they're screening off, which is, I think, what's, what's, what's the key here. Um, I had a question and a comment that's rather similar to the issue raised much more sophisticatedly <laughs> my previous speaker. Um, my first sort of reaction when I saw the, the diagrams such as one you, you put up there, that's, that's great, was, well, I presume that they switched left and right in the course of the experiment, right? Because yeah, they if, they, if they did, then there is a red arrow we could introduce between the... Right, the, they, 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 they put those around. How did they do it with the noisy and the silent trapdoor cases? I mean, with the visual case, it's easy to switch left and right because, you know, check the C, the opaque and the transparent. With, with, I just wondered, with the silent and noisy thing, how do you do that? Well, I, you get your screwdriver out. And <laughs> so you demonstrate you take that out, which one is noisy. And you put it in here, is that? Yeah, so you I have to sort of show them that it's making a noise on Oh, no, well, they have to discover this. Okay. Uh, I, well, okay, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I'm not remembering the details of how, of how they... Yeah. But the main point is the But trouble. you want to vary left and right, so there's, that's not a conflict. <coughs> and I, I, I think they did that. These are kind of, I mean, aren't these kind of interesting experiments? I mean, mm -hmm. you look at these and think, wait a minute, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe they do form beliefs about what the other guy hears and sees. And there are lots of, I mentioned some of the variations in each of these, and there are some others where they're, they're, they're constantly trying to think about killjoy hypotheses and how to deal with them <laughs> and, and set up the experiment so it's not going to run into that problem. They're pretty careful. I think we have time for just a couple more questions. So, I mean, so if you want to turn this line of argument into purely sort of statistical reasoning, how is it going, I mean, how is it really going to settle things? Why couldn't the behaviorists? So there's like a slide in the middle where you've had the two theories and you've got to draw a red arrow at the top. Why can't the behaviorists just add an arrow to their behavior in the picture? Or even why? Right. Okay. Because all you've found sort of is that there's an arrow. All right, so I'm, I'm, to get this moving, I have to regard behaviorism as somehow constraining uh, what you can learn from one experiment and to take over and apply to the other. Um, and, I mean, I tried to make a kind of intuitive case for thinking that if this is really pure behavior reading, forming this belief shouldn't raise the probability of forming that belief. But if the behavior sort of wants to stipulate that that's true, then we have a new behavior reading hypothesis, and of course then they both predict a uh, failure of screening off, so the statistical test doesn't work anymore. So, you got, I mean, I, so, a key part of the argument is thinking about what are we actually saying when we say that an organism is only a behavior reader? What kind of limitations does that impose on what it's probably going to do, what it's not probably going to do? Um, so, I mean, that's going to correspondingly, right? So, right. And, and, and it seems like if you sort of got the range of possibilities, so you're kind of shrinking down the, men the behavioristic ones. Now, but correspondingly, you're sort of expanding the mentalistic ones to yes. a case where basically these would be the same thing, even though there's an arrow. 
two of them. And it looks like, because of the particular hypothesis you put there, it's more fine-grained than that. I should say that the, uh, although the chimpanzees behaved in ways that showed that they were, you know, most of them kind of sensitive to what we might think of as sort of subtle differences and like whether the, the human being is in the box or not in the Mellis experiment actually influences whether they bother about which trapdoor or which tunnel they use. If the human being's there, they just choose at random. So you think, and then the human being is in the box and they're kind of, they're, they're going to tend to use the tunnel that, that's opaque. They'll tend to use the trapdoor that's silent, but they don't do it flawlessly. Um, so it would not surprise me at all if this experiment that I, I'm suggesting comes out with evidence for screening off. Now, and it's maybe, there, maybe there's no carryover. They're, not, they're just not that smart, maybe. Okay. Um, now, if we modify behaviorism this to, to put an arrow here, then it will not be, I, I don't think it would be fair for it to embrace that, oh, that's what my theory predicted all along. <laughs> so, you know, kind of, we, I think behaviorists have to decide, and people who are thinking about behavior, it's not just the people who believe it, what kinds of constraints on belief formation are we actually <coughs> thinking of plausibly as part of that? I think the, the, the mind reading thing is, I mean, it's, to me it makes sense that if you're really a mind reader, that makes, that doesn't ensure that you'll think this if you think that, but it at least raises the probability. It's on the table. It's part of your mental capacities that you can see a similarity here and then think it's relevant. Pretty roughly. Um, so. I think we have to stop there. Um, uh, there are lots more questions I have several myself, um, but, but uh, 